we were we were last time. Uh, we uh, worked out a general relationship for a rotation operator represented in axis angle form, acting on an arbitrary vector u. There's three terms involving trigonometric functions and then vector cross products and dot products and so on. In a special case in which the angle is very small, this uh, simplifies and becomes just u, which is the identity term, plus a small correction, which is the angle of theta times the axis crossed into the vector u. Now, there's another approach to small angle rotations, which starts from uh, just rotation matrix as an orthogonal matrix. Uh, if it's a small angle rotation, the matrix R has to be close to the identity, so we write the correction term as epsilon times A. Uh, the epsilon here is just a reminder that this term is so small, and if we wanted to, we could absorb the epsilon into the definition of A, and then we just have to think of A as being like a small matrix. But I split out the epsilon just as really for psychological reasons to remind you that that term is small. And then at the end of the hour last time, I showed that if you uh, impose a requirement that, uh, that R be orthogonal, R transpose R's identity, it follows that this matrix A is anti-symmetric. So <clears throat> the rule here is, is that the small correction matrix for a small angle rotation is an anti-symmetric matrix superimposed on the identity, of course, which is what holds at the uh, holds for zero angles. Did you All right. Sign? Excuse me. Should there be a minus sign in this identity? Minus sign. Oh, excuse me. Yes, this would be symmetric. This is minus a transpose indeed. They're anti-symmetric matrices. Now, uh, so let's talk about anti-symmetric matrices. These are three by three matrices. Let's write them out, write one out. It has to have zeros on the diagonal because it's anti-symmetric. In the one, two position, let's co put a coefficient I'll call minus A3. And on the opposite side, we have to have plus A3. In the upper right, let's put what we'll call A2 and then minus A2 opposite that. In the remaining slot, minus A1 and then A1 here, plus A1 on the other side. Uh, so this is, uh, as you can see, is an arbitrary anti-symmetric matrix expressed in terms of three real parameters, A1, A2, and A3. Let's write this this way as A1 times the matrix, which has the components 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 1, 0, plus A2 times A2 times the matrix 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 0 plus A3 times the matrix, which is 0, minus 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 0, like this. And if I do this, then you see that these three matrices that I've written here form a basis of 3 by 3 matrices that span the space of all possible anti-symmetric matrices. And we uh, can get rid of some of these pretty pieces of chalk here. Uh, and that these, um, uh, and that these uh, lowercase a's are the expansion coefficients. Now, uh, let's write these three matrices, give them names. I'll call the first one J1 of the script J. The second one is J2, and the third one we'll call J3. Uh, uh, when I write uh, notes on a computer, I use sans serif fonts for these matrices because that, that's, a, that's just, a, just a standard for matrices. And on the blackboard, I'll write in the script J's here. But anyway, remember that these are three matrices. So this uh, linear combination here, it's conventional to write it in a particular way. It's divided as a, dotted, a vector dotted into j vector. In other words, here a is a vector of numbers, three numbers, and j is a vector of, th quote unquote, vector of three by three matrices. This is a similar to the, uh, this is similar to the notation a dot sigma that you're, that you're used to in quantum mechanics, or sigma or the poly matrices. Here a is a vector of numbers, and sigma is a quote-unquote vector of two by two matrices. So it's the same type of notation. But when you use this, you have to remember that the J is really a vector of matrices. Anyway, this is just notation. So this shows that an arbitrary anti-symmetric matrix can be associated with a three vector, A, uh, if you quote-unquote dot it into this vector of basis matrices. And that's a nice notation for anti-symmetric matrices. This also introduces for us these uh, these matrices script J, which I'll, uh, which I'll be telling you about. Actually, I intended to do this on another board so you can see it without covering it up. But uh, if you can kind of hold your, hold your attention to that. Before I cover it up, let me mention, uh, well, since I started here, maybe I'll finish at this board. Let me just mention uh, some facts about this. You can see these J matrices are, are constants. 
They just have ones and zeros and minus ones in them. Uh, and uh, in fact, let me list the properties, the properties of the uh, of the J matrices here. There's really two properties, and each one comes in two versions. The first one is, is that if you look at the components of one of these J matrices, call it Ji, and then take the Jk component of it, the answer is, is that it's a um, levi chibia symbol by epsilon i Jk uh, with, as it turns out, a minus sign in front. And to check that, you just need to look at the ones and zeros here. There's 27 numbers that, will, that turn out to be this. It's just another way of writing epsilon symbol, actually. There's a close variation on this property, which is the following. Maybe I'll derive it before I, uh, before I uh, write it down. The derivation, the, uh, derivation is this, is that if you take J, let's take, let's take A dotted into J. This is, of course, an anti-symmetric matrix. And let's let, multiply that onto an arbitrary vector U. Matrix multiplication times a vector. Um, let me this J more clear. This is J. Um, Let's take the ith component of this and work it out. This is the same thing as the matrix A dotted into J, the ij component of that times uj, where I'm using a summation convention. And that's the same thing as A sub k times J sub k, the ij component of that, uh, times u sub j, just by using what we mean by A dot j, it's this. Uh, but then, Accepting that the j's are related to the epsilon symbol like this, this becomes equal to minus a sub k times epsilon kij times uj. And now let me swap the k and the i, swap two indices in the epsilon, which gives a change in sign. So this becomes with a plus sign, epsilon i kj times a sub k times u sub j. That in turn is the same thing as the cross product A cross U, the ith component of that. So the ith component at the top is equal to the ith component at the bottom, so the two vectors are equal. And this gives me property 1B, which I want to write out, which is that matrix, anti symmetric matrix A dotted into J, by matrix multiplication acting on a vector U, is the same thing as A cross U. And this is useful because it gives a matrix uh, notation for the cross product, which it turns out is uh, quite useful in the applications. So these are properties 1A and 1B. Now, there's a second set of properties I'll call 2A and 2B. These are commutation relations. If we commute the commutation, compute the commutation relations of two of these J matrices, Ji with Jj, uh, which you do just by doing the matrix multiplication, uh, you'll find that this is epsilon i j k times j sub k. This, of course, reminds you of the commutation relations of the Pauli matrices. And you see we're getting similar linear combinations here and here, although these j matrices are coming out of classical rotations and by themselves don't have anything to do with quantum mechanics. In fact, they really only have to do with Euclidean geometry and three-dimensional space in that sense, and they don't have anything to do with classical mechanics either. It's just cheap geometry is all. Anyway, this is the commutation relations, which I'll let you verify by multiplying the matrices. Now, there's a variation on this, which I'll call 2B, and it has this form. If we take A dotted into J, this is one particular anti-symmetric matrix parameterized by the three vector A, and then take another anti-symmetric matrix parameterized by a different three vector, call it B. Well, it's easy to show the commutator of two anti-symmetric matrices is, is, is anti-symmetric. So the result has to be expressible in terms of the dot product of some three vector into the J matrices. And the question is, what is that three vector? The answer is that it's the cross product of A with B. It's A cross B dotted into J. So these are the, these then are the, uh, these are the main properties of the J matrices which we'll use. All right, so this is a way of talking about J matrices. <coughs> By the way, if we go back to this earlier expression we had for a, uh, I'll call this an infinitesimal rotation. Uh, the rotation is an infinitesimal. The angle is, however, it's a small angle. That's what I mean by an infinitesimal rotation. The rotation itself is an identity plus a small direction. Let's take this, and now let's use, uh, let's use this property number 1B here. 
which allows us to re-express the cross product in terms of these J matrices. So this says that this line, uh, this box here, is equal to, first of all, there's the U, which I'll copy. And then for this cross product, we can write it this way as theta times n hat dotted into script J. That's a matrix multiplying U. This, of course, is the same thing as the identity plus theta times n hat dotted into J. The whole thing multiplying U. And the result is, is that the near identity rotation matrix can be a block of up down here at the bottom, can be written, these are also tiny and useless, can be written this way, is that R of n hat comma theta is equal to the identity plus theta times n hat dotted into script J. And there's extra terms, this is only the leading term of theta, and this applies when theta is, is small if you neglect the higher order terms and it's, a, it's an approximation of theta small. So this is another way of writing a near identity rotation matrix now in terms of these J matrices. Okay. All right. Now, uh, next let me, unfortunately I have to cover this up, next let me make some comments about uh, commutativity of the rotation matrices. Uh, let's uh, say we've got two rotation matrices, R1 and R2, which are related, uh, which are defined in terms of different axes and different angles. So the first one has, a, has an axis N1, theta 1, and the second one has an axis N2, theta 2. This is just two arbitrary rotations now. Uh, I just want to make a very simple point at this point, which is that R1, R2 is not equal to R2, R1 in general. In general. Uh, and to believe this, all you have to do is just try an example. Uh, so uh, if you, for example, multiply, do a rotation about the x-axis and then one about the y-axis by pi over 2 is something simple. And then do it in the other order. I'll let you do this for yourselves in your spare time, your copious spare time. And uh, if you do, you'll see the answers are not the same. So this, this is a way of saying the rotations don't be in general. Uh, in the language of group theory, we say that uh, SO3 is a non abelian group. Uh, and uh, this terminology is used pretty much these days, so I'll just tell you what it means. Non abelian, when applied to group, just means non commutative. That's all it means. So uh, the uh, statement is that the rotation group, which is the, in this case, the group of, these are, these are the proper rotations. This is said to be a non abelian group. It just means that general rotations don't commute. If I may go back to this expression down here at the bottom of the board, which we derived here for a small angle rotation, it's expressed in terms of the axis of the rotation dotted into these J matrices multiplied by the angle of the rotation. You can see this is the first term of a Taylor series expansion of the rotation matrix in terms of powers of the angle. And there's a question about what the higher order terms are. As it turns out, it's actually pretty easy to get the higher order terms. And I'll now show you how, how we do this. We we'll use this result, the knowledge of the first order term, and it turns out that's enough to get all the other, other terms without too much trouble. So here's how this works. We block this off because I don't need this anymore. So here's what we do is we, we take a rotation in axis angle form and we look for a differential equation in terms of the angle theta. Uh, actually, before I proceed, let me do go back to this, this earlier remarks about the commutativity of rotations. Because there is an exception to this. There's an exception when rotations do compute. And that's when the axes are the same. Now, this is geometrically clear. If I have an axis n hat like this, and then, and then you do a rotation by the right-handed rule, it's how you do rotations. It's pretty clear that the rotations about a fixed axis just add, the angles add. So in other words, you have r of n hat comma theta 1, let's say, times r of n hat, uh, n hat comma theta 2, where the point is these are the same axes. This is the same thing as r of the axis n hat theta 1 plus theta 2. The angles just add. And this is the same thing if, if you do this in the in the other order. You multiply in the other order. 
So rotation matrices do commute if the axes are the same. In general, they don't commute because the two axes in general are not the same. Now, using that fact, I can work out a, a useful expression for the derivative of a rotation matrix in axis angle form. It's actually pretty easy. So we'll write this using the definition of the derivative. It's a limit as epsilon goes to zero of R of n hat comma theta plus epsilon minus R of n hat comma theta divided by epsilon. However, the first term in this, in this numerator here is the same thing as R of n hat comma epsilon multiplied times R of n hat comma theta because that's the same axis, about the same axis, and so the angles just add. And so you see the entire numerator has a factor of R of n hat comma theta, which I can take out to the right. So this thing turns into the limit as epsilon goes to zero of R of n hat comma epsilon minus identity divided by epsilon times R of n hat comma theta. And now, in this limit, you see we have a small angle, a small angle rotation. And we know what that is. Now here at the bottom of the board, it's identity plus the angle times n hat dot j. Now here I call the angle theta, and here I'm calling it epsilon. But the result is that if you subtract off the identity and divide by epsilon, what's left over is just the n hat dot j. So this whole thing just becomes n hat dot of j times R of n hat comma theta. n hat dot j is independent of theta. So this is a differential equation which is easy to solve. The solution is this. This is R of n hat comma theta. There's an initial condition, by the way, which is R of n hat comma zero is equal to the identity if the angle is zero and the rota rotation matrix is the identity. And subject to this initial condition, the solution is that it's the exponential of theta times n hat dotted into script j. And this is an important result. It's the exponential form of rotation. Prop these are pro all proper rotations now. Proper rotations in axis angle form. And uh, <coughs> so if we expand this out in a, in a Taylor series, we get the identity plus theta times n hat dotted into script j plus theta squared over 2 factorial times n hat dotted into script j squared plus dot dot dot. It's easy to write down the general term. And this uh, confirms what I said a minute ago, that, that this earlier, earlier result we got uh, can be extended up. We can, we can extend this into the Taylor series and write down the general term. It's just an exponential series. And this is, this is what it is here. So this is an important result. All right, that's the exponential form for matrices, rotation matrices in axis assignment form. All right. Now, I'd next like to, uh, I'd next like to move on to another result. Uh, and uh, the uh, story on this begins with the cross product. Let's take the cross product of two vectors. I'll call them A and, a and U, like this. It is a fact about proper rotations that the cross product transforms as a vector. What that means in the present context is that if you take the cross product of these two vectors and then rotate the result like this by some rotation, this is a proper rotation now. Uh, in fact, I'll almost exclusively be talking about proper rotations for the next uh, quite a bit of time. We'll come back to improper ones when we want to discuss parity. Uh, but for a proper rotation, we rotate these, these, the uh, cross product. And the answer, it turns out, is the same as if you rotate the vectors first and then take the cross product second. So this is the same thing as Ra, that vector, crossed with the vector Ru. Okay. Now, I'm not going to prove this uh, formula. Rather, I'll uh, leave it as an exercise for you. Uh, but when you do this exercise, what you'll find is the answer is only true if the rotation R is proper. If the rotation R is improper, you get a minus sign on the other side. If you wanted to handle both cases, what you would do is you would insert a sign here, which is the determinant of R, 
which is, of course, equal to plus or minus 1, the plus sign being the proper ones and the minus 1 being the improper ones. One of the ways of saying this is that if you take a cross product of two vectors, what you get is a pseudo, so-called pseudo vector. The difference between vectors and pseudo vectors is how they transform under, under parity. Parity is an example of an improper rotation. They change sign under improper rotations, whereas under ordinary rotations, they don't. Well, for now, I only want to talk about proper rotation, so I'll leave that sign out, and we just have a plus sign on the right-hand side. All right. Now, um, I want to use this to derive a useful result. And I'm going to uh, use this notation, which I got covered up, unfortunately, the notation for the cross product, which is property 1B here, that A cross with U is A dot J multiplying U. A dot J is the matrix, and that's matrix multiplication. And um, so let's use that notation to rewrite this. So on the left-hand side, what we've got is we're rotating. Now, A cross U is the same thing as A dotted into J multiplying U. A dotted into J is a matrix, so now you can see this is a product of two matrices multiplying U. And on the right-hand side, we can write this as RA, which is a vector, dotted into the matrix of the, the matrix, of, excuse me, the vector of matrices, three, three matrices J, like this, multiplying R U, like this. So this is again a matrix multiplication, this matrix times that one. You can view this in a sense as a kind of a commutation rule, because if I've got R multiplying times this anti-symmetric matrix, and I want to pull the R through it, what I have to do is replace the A there by R, and then the R appears on the other side. It kind of drops part of itself on the A. Anyway, in fact, this is where this is going. It's a kind of a commutation relation or a conjugation relation involving anti-symmetric matrices. Uh, to bring this out more clearly, uh, let's replace, let's, let's write uh, a U equal to R inverse of another vector that's called B. Because if we do this, then this equation becomes R times A dotted into J times R inverse multiplying vector B is equal to on the right hand side RA, which is a vector dotted into J, which gives us a matrix, which multiplies RU. You see RU is this running backwards, RU is equal to is equal to B. So it's just V over the right hand side like this. And now the V is arbitrary, so we'll strike it on both sides. And to summarize this, we get an equation that says that R times A dotted into J times R inverse is equal to R A vector dotted into J. We box that because that's indeed a useful formula. We'll even give this a name, call it the adjoint formula. This is not an official name, it's just my name, but this is in fact related to the adjoint representation of the group, which is why I call it that. I won't take you into that, but it's just, it is useful to have a name for this. Uh, there are several ways of viewing this result. Uh, A dot J is an arbitrary anti-symmetric matrix, which is being parameterized in terms of this three-vector A by uh, using this basis, basis matrix J. Now, it's easy to show that if you take an anti-symmetric matrix and you conjugate by a rotation, you get another anti-symmetric matrix. And so, the question, so that, therefore, is also expressible in terms of some three-vector dotted into J. And the question is, what is the new three-vector? And the answer is just the rotated version of the old three-vector. So conjugating anti-symmetric matrices is equivalent to rotating the corresponding vectors. So that's the meaning of this equation. Now, this, this leads to another useful result. Let's let A here be equal to beta times n hat, the axis times, times an angle. So to write this out, we just have R times theta n hat dotted into J times R inverse with this in parentheses here, is equal to theta times R n hat dotted into J. And now, allow me to exponentiate both sides. There's an E there, and there's an E there. We can be equal to each other to exponentiate them. On the left-hand side, we've got an expression that looks like this. It's e to the a times b times a minus 1. It's that exponential. 
You had something like this in the homework problem a couple of weeks ago. This is the same thing as A times E to the D A inverse. That's to say it's the same as conjugating. You conjugate an exponential, it's the same thing as exponentiating the conjugated matrix. You get this just by writing out the power series. And then each term is just a power. Conjugating a power is like conjugating each factor. So, so this left hand side is the same thing as R times E to the theta n hat dotted in the J times R inverse. I think it will avoid some confusion here. If instead of writing R, I call this R0, let me, let me put a zero subscript on this R that appears here everywhere just to distinguish it from another rotation matrix which is coming up in a moment. R0 is any rotation, but let's just put a zero on it. <coughs> so this is all following from, from this exaggerated formula above. So what you can see here is in the middle you've got a rotation matrix and that's the axis angle form. And it's being conjugated by a rotation matrix R0. And the right hand side is another rotation matrix and axis angle form except the axis has been rota rotated. And so to summarize this, the formula can be written this way is that R0 times R of n hat comma theta times R0 inverse is equal to R of R0 n hat comma theta. Let me box that result, which is another important result. This is essentially an exponentiated version of the adjoint formula. And uh, so uh, I'll also call it it's, it's so it's related in such a simple way to the adjoint formula. I'll just call this the exponentiated version of it. But let's think about what it means. It says that if you take a rotation in axis angle form and you conjugate by 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 second by second rotation, a fixed rotation R zero, of course you're going to get a new rotation. And the question is what happens to the axis and the angle? And the first thing we say is the angle doesn't change. It's a new rotation of the same angle. But the axis has been rotated by the rotation that you use for the conjugation. Now, one of the ways of saying this in words, which helps remember it, is to say that the axis of a rotation transforms as a vector under rotations. And the angle of a rotation transforms as a scalar. It doesn't change. This is all logical and, and simple. It has a simple meaning, but that's, this is one way of looking at it. All right. Now, uh, all right. So that's the exponentiated version of that joint formula. I'm going to apply it in just a moment. In fact, I'm going to apply it next. So far, we've been parameterizing rotations in axis angle form. Uh, you can see there's really three parameters here. There's certainly one parameter in the angle, but a unit vector is equivalent to a point on a, on a unit sphere, and that requires two angles. So if you want to write it in terms of angles, you see there's altogether three angles implied in this parameterization. So the basic rule is that to parameterize a rotation requires three parameters. The set of rotations is a three-dimensional space. Um, this is one of the common parameterizations of rotations. Another common parameterization is Euler angles, and I want to tell you about that now. So the basic idea of Euler angles works like this. Let's start with our coordinate system x, y, z, our inertial frame like this. And this has uh, unit vectors I'll call e hat i. i equals 1, 2, 3 means x, y, and z. And let's suppose we have uh, let's, let's, let's suppose we've got some fixed rotation R that we're just given. The point here is to parameterize it. Let's give a, give a fixed rotation R. Let's let R act on these old basis vectors and give us ourselves new ones, which we call pi prime. So this means that it's a new axis, set of axes. Now let me try to sketch them in here as best I can. Let's say this is x prime, this is y prime, this is z prime, like this. Gives us two frames. An old frame and a rotated frame. Now, I'm going to take it as geometrically obvious that if you specify the orientations of all three axes of the rotated frame, that's equivalent to specifying the rotation R. 
So to parameterize the rotation r, we need to parameterize the orientations of the three primed axes. Well, there's three of them. Let's simplify and just start with the z-axis. So let me draw this picture again, except I'll, I'll, I'll omit the x prime and y prime axes here. Here's the old axes, x, y, and z. And here's the z prime axis like this. Now, by our, by our, our rotation matrix R, maps all the old axes into the new ones. And so in particular, it maps the z axis into the z prime axis. Let's parameterize the z prime axis by the spherical coordinates. We want the orientation of the z prime axis. Let's parameterize it by its usual spherical angles. Let's call it polar angle beta and the azimuthal angle alpha, like this. So those are two angles giving us the orientation of the z prime axis. Now, allow me to define another rotation, which is not the same as our fixed one we started with. I'll call it R1, but it's one subscript on it, just to distinguish it from the old one. So R1 is defined this way. It's equal to R of z hat comma alpha times R of y hat comma beta. Now, the reason this is interesting is because it turns out that R1 also maps the old z axis into the new z prime axis. And to see that, all we have to do is just draw pictures. So if I take the old axes, x, y, and z, like this, here's the original z prime unit vector sticking up like that on the z prime axis. Now let's begin by applying a, a rotation about the y axis by an angle beta. This is the right hand rule you see around the y axis. Of course, you do, you do the rotation on the right first, and then you move from right to left in the order in which the operators are applied. So this is going to take this z vector and swing it down in the xz plane by an angle of beta like this. Okay. Then we follow that by rotation about the z axis by an angle alpha. Let me look this up here so I have a little more room. So we're going to do this by an angle alpha. And that's going to take this vector and swing it out in a cone, as you can see, and bring the vector over to a new orientation like this, in which the angle alpha is the usual as a mutual angle of the, of, the, of the new vector. And the angle beta is this one. So that coincides with the usual uh, spherical, court, spherical angles of the new z prime axis. So by drawing a picture like this, what we see is, is that the rotation R1 also maps z, z, z hat, which is, is the, the z axis into the z prime axis. It does the same thing as our original matrix R. Or given given rotation R. Now, does this imply that these two rotations are the same? Well, no, because they both of them have the same effect on the z-axis. They put the they put the z prime axis in the right orientation, but nothing says that they're going to get the x prime and y prime axes right. In general, they don't. So R1 and R differ from one another because they don't do the same thing to the x and y prime axis. However, if the z prime axis is right, then the x and y prime axes can only be wrong by some rotation about the z prime direction. So if we take this r1 and follow it by a rotation about the z prime direction by some angle is called a gamma, if you choose gamma right, you're guaranteed to get the x prime and y prime axes right. So there must be some angle gamma such that r is equal to r of z hat prime comma gamma times r1. And if you write out R1, this is the same thing as R of z hat prime comma gamma times R of z hat comma alpha times R of y comma beta. And this gives us the Euler manual parameterization. The usual R will now write as R of alpha beta gamma is equal to this. This is our original R that we started with. And um, you can even see what the ranges on these three angles have to be. First of all, alpha and, alpha and beta are easy to interpret because they're the polar angles of the z prime axis. So the alpha is the azimuthal angle, and it has to be in the range of 0 to 2 pi. And beta is the polar angle, so it has to be in the range of 0 to pi. Let me see that the other end, so you get the south pole. And then the gamma is the rotation that gets the x and y prime axes right inside their, their x, x prime y prime plane. That 
the total requires an angle in the range of 0 to 2 pi. And so these are the ranges on the Euler angles, such that if alpha, beta, and gamma are in those ranges, you cover all possible rotations. Well, the way that this is written out is that this is, this is all right, but the way that this is written out is not the most convenient form for the, uh, for the Euler angles because the rotations, the, thing, the rotation, the given rotation is now being expressed as a product of three rotations, but you can see it's a mixture of old and new axes. There's two old axes, Z, Z and Y, but there's, there's the new axis, the primed axis there. And it's more convenient to write it purely in terms of the old axes. Yes? Uh, how do you know Mr. You don't, but the point is we, w we want to be able to parameterize an arbitrary rotation in terms of three angles. I mean, so if you gave me an arbitrary rotation, I could actually work this out and find out what, what extra angle needed to be, needed to be opposed to it. To, uh, to do this. I think what you're driving at is, is that uh, the geometrical interpretation of gamma is not as clear as it is at alpha and beta, and that's certainly true. It's related to the line of nodes between the planes. You think about that. But right now, let's just say there is there exists an angle gamma in the range of 0 to 2 pi. All right. Um, now, um, now uh, so uh, we'll fix this up in the following way. Let's, let's, write, let's take this first expression here. So here's our r of alpha, beta, gamma. And it's equal to uh, r of z hat of beta, gamma times r1. Allow me to write it this way. It's r1 times r1 inverse times r of z hat prime comma gamma times r1. Write it like that. And the reason I do that is because now the last three factors are a conjugation of a rotation by a second rotation r1. Well, here's our nice formula up above, which we just worked out. I call it R0 here, and I'm calling it R1 there. And it's actually R0 there corresponds to R1 inverse here, because you can see there's an inverse on the left-hand side. But the result is, is that this thing is a rotation with the same angle gamma, but now it's got to be the inverse rotated, R1 inverse, applied to Z hat prime, and that's the axis. That's what this is equal to. Well, um, here's, here's what R1 did to Z. So R1 inverse applied to Z hat prime takes us back to the original unrotated axis Z. So this is the same thing as R of Z hat prime gamma. And so you see we've gone from the primed axis to the unprimed axis by this conjugation. And so the final result is, in effect, what I've done is I've taken this this thing here and moved it over to the other side, and in so doing, you can drop the prime. And so the result is this, is an R of alpha, beta, gamma, is equal to R of z hat comma alpha, R of y hat comma beta, times R of z hat comma gamma. The product of three rotations that look like this. And that's the Euler angle parameterization this is the most convenient form for the Euler angle parameterization of the application matrices. Now, um, this is uh, sometimes called the ZYZ convention for Euler angles, and I'm in, in addition, I'm using the active point of view on rotations, which, as I mentioned last time, is, is following throughout this whole this whole subject. Um, you've probably seen Euler angles in your course of classical mechanics. And uh, there they, use, they almost always use a ZXZ uh, convention. And uh, they also use the passive uh, uh, point of view. So there's, there's uh, details are different, but the basic idea is the same. Uh, it's convenient to use the ZYZ convention in quantum mechanics because, uh, actually, they started doing this because of the conventions we have for which of the, which of the, which of the poly matrices are real and which ones are imaginary and why one is imaginary. So reasons for that. All right. So that's the story of the learning. Uh, all right. Now, one last topic of classical rotations before I move on to quantum rotations and quantum mechanics. And this is to uh, examine the uh, question of commutativity of rotations in more detail. 
Uh, let's write down two rotations, let's say R1 and R2, which have different axes and angles, N1 theta 1 and uh, N2 theta 2. And if we write these in exponential form, we can write the first one as e to the a1 and e to the second one as e to the a2, where a1 and a2 are anti-symmetric matrices. a1 is equal to theta 1 times n hat 1 divided into script j. And a2 is the theta 2 times n hat 2 divided into script j. Now, I mentioned earlier that r1 times r2 is not in general the same thing as r2 times r1. Uh, let me introduce a matrix which is R1 times R2 times R1 inverse times R2 inverse. Uh, and call this matrix C just to give it a name. First thing to notice is that if R1 and R2 do commute, then I can bring the R1 inverse past the R2 here, and it cancels out with R1. And then likewise, what's left over is R2 times R2 inverse. That cancels. The result is, is that C is equal to the identity if uh, R1, R2 is equal to R2, R1, if they happen to commute. And if they don't commute, then this is, this is in some sense a measure of the amount by which they don't commute. Now, I need to tell you this. I hesitate to tell you this. But in the mathematical literature, the C is called the commutator. The reason I hesitate is because it's not the commutator that you're used to in quantum mechanics. It is, however, related to the commutator that you're used to. And I'll show you now how that's so. Um, it's uh, particularly interesting to look at this, this matrix C in a special case in which the angles, theta 1 and theta 2, are small. So let's do a Taylor series expansion of these four factors and powers of the angles and see what happens to C when the angles are small. Maybe before I do that, let me mention that in the book, in Sakurai's book, he does an example of, of where he considers a first rotation about the x-axis about some angle and then about the y-axis by a different angle. And then he reverses the order, goes back in x and back in y. And what he shows us is that the final, the final result is a rotation about the z-axis. Well, that's just what this is doing. It's going in one direction and another, and then backwards in one, and then backwards in the other. So it's, this, is, this is a slight generalization of what he does in the book. All right. Anyway, if we expand these out in series, then for r1, we've got the identity plus a1 plus 1 half a1 squared plus dot dot dot. That's the exponential series. And then for R2, it's identity plus A2 plus 1 half A2 squared plus dot, dot, dot. And then for R1 inverse, it's identity minus A1 plus 1 half A1 squared plus dot, dot, dot. And then for R2 inverse, it's identity minus A2 plus 1 half A2 squared plus dot, dot, dot. Writing out the exponential series, which I carry out in second order on the blackboard there. Now, you multiply these four things together, obviously what you get at lowest order is the identity. And then at first order, what you get is just the sum of the first four order terms here, which is a1 plus a2 minus a1 minus a2, which is 0. So let me just write this as 1 plus 0. This c thing vanishes in first order when the angles are small. If you want to get a, 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 the next correction, uh, in other words, if you're interested in how these, these two matrices don't commute with each other, you've got to see how it is that C differs from the identity. And if you want to do that, you have to go to second order. That's why I expanded these series here to second order. So now we go through and collect up all the second order terms. There's some algebra in that. There's six second order terms. I'll let you do it. What you find is, is that the second order, when the smoke clears, is actually the commutator of the matrices A1 and A2 in the usual sense in quantum mechanics. And then there's higher order charts. This is second order charge. In fact, plugging in the specific values of A1 and A2 in terms of the axes and angles, this becomes the identity plus theta 1 times theta 2 times the commutator of n hat 1 dotted into j with the commutator of n hat 2 dotted into j plus higher order charts. Now we'll go back to the properties of the J matrices, which are summarized over here. And I'll point you to property 2B. The commutator of two of these asymmetric matrices is expressed in terms of the cross product of the corresponding vectors. And so the result is that expanding in power series, this matrix C is the identity plus 
theta 1 times theta 2 times n hat 1 cross with n hat 2 got it into j plus my order terms. And that's something I'll just post that result because we'll need it in a little while. space, it's three-dimensional Euclidean geometry, it's really all the same uh, algebra here. Now, however, I want to turn to the question of, uh, of rotation operators in quantum mechanics. Uh, let's begin by supposing we have a quantum system, and so there's some Hilbert space of states uh, for the system. And in fact, at the beginning, we're not going to be very specific about what the system is, because there's a lot of uh, conclusions that can be drawn without having to do that. So we're not going to say necessarily whether it's a spin system or whether there's orbital degrees of freedom or multi-particle or relativistic or any of those things will actually won't matter. Some quantum system. And um, what we like to do is to make a reasonable definition of what we'll call rotation operators, which are which we'll think of as being parameterized by the classical rotations R. So U is an operator that acts on this Hilbert space. The fact that it's parameterized by the classical, uh, uh, the classical rotation R, we know this way, so given, given the classical rotation, we can associate it with a corresponding operator U of R. And in some sense, what U of R will do is rotate our quantum system. Before I go on, we need to think a little bit about physically about what it means to rotate a quantum system. If you have like the 2p state of a, of a hydrogen atom, that's a certain wave function, and um, you want to ask, what does it mean to rotate it? Well, um, you can't go in with a wrench and uh, turn an electron in, in a hydrogen atom. So in, in that sense, what does it mean to rotate? But I need to point out or remind you uh, that uh, in spite of the language we use all the time about, we say, the wave function of the electron, the truth is, is what, the, what the wave function represents is the statistical results of measurements on an ensemble of identically prepared systems. It describes the properties of an, an ensemble and not so much of a single system. Now, the ensemble itself is prepared by some preparation apparatus, which for simplicity we may assume prepares a pure state. One can also talk about density operators. But let's say you have apparatus that prepares a pure state. So one way to define the rotated state is to say that it's the state produced by the rotated preparation apparatus. And that's certainly clear because you can always rotate your stern gerlach apparatus, for example. All right, so that's one point of view on rotation operators in, in quantum mechanics. Another point of view is that rotation operators in quantum mechanics oftentimes arise as a result of interactions or as the time evolution of specific systems. This is most uh, uh, notably true in the case of spin systems and magnetic fields, which give rise to rotations of the spins. We'll look at that in detail after a while. But in any case, this gives you some, at least some idea about what rotation operators in quantum mechanics mean from a physical standpoint. Well, right now, we want to address the general question about how can we take a classical rotation and, in general, produce an operator uh, that represents those rotations. So to do this, we're going to make some postulates or demands on what this operators, the operators U of R should satisfy. These are reasonable, reasonable demands. The first one is, is that the operator U of R should be unitary. And this follows from the requirement that symmetry operations should preserve probabilities. If you rotate a system, you don't expect particles to disappear. So uh, it should be unitary. The second simple requirement is, is that the unitary operator corresponding to the identity should be the identity operator in quantum mechanics. And the third requirement, which is less trivial, is that if we take the, the unitary operator corresponding to a product of rotations, it should correspond to the product of the unitary operators. Like this. And these are the requirements we'll impose. 
Now, if we find a set of unitary operators that satisfy these, these three postulates, then what we say is that we have a representation, is the magic word here. It's used uh, frequently in quantum mechanics. Uh, more exactly, this mapping that takes you from the classical rotations to the quantum rotations is a representation of the classical rotations by means of unitary operators which act on the Hilbert space. That means that these unitary operators reproduce the multiplication law of the classical rotations. That's the idea. As it turns out, these three postulates I've written down here are in general too strong, and we can't actually meet them. We'll see this comes up. It has to do with spin lattice systems. But you can almost meet these requirements, and when you and when you uh, uh, when you're done, you, you learn some extra things about spin one half systems. This is an extra minus one phase that comes when you rotate a, an electron by 360 degrees. We'll come back to that in, in just a little while. All right. Anyway, uh, these are the postulates, and now the problem is to work out the consequences. So, I get it all. So, we'll stop here. Uh, we'll pick up with this next time.